I think nobody should be appointed to decision-making positions if they're not thinking about the future generations. That's what young people can say. If you don't care about climate change, if you don't believe in doing something about it, if you maintain it's just a cycle that we can't have anything to do with, then that person doesn't deserve to be in office. It's like so many of the problems that we face. Uh, we really need to think holistically. And of course, we should be worried about the suffering uh, of people. But at the same time, the, the climate crisis and the loss of biodiversity, because they go absolutely together. We mustn't forget about that. And we have to realize that war is actually having an unbelievable impact on the environment. And it's emitting vast amounts of uh, fossil fuel, CO2, into the atmosphere to add to the greenhouse gases. Because we're human and we have, uh, humanity needs to address human suffering. But we mustn't forget that if we don't at the same time address the climate crisis, that's going to lead to more and more and more suffering. Like already there are climate refugees, places where there's no water to grow the food, where it's too hot, where people are dying, people are flooded, lands are disappearing under the ocean already as the ice is melting. Once young people understand the problem and they are empowered to take action, there's no stopping them. Their enthusiasm, their determination, they start something, it doesn't work, they don't give up, they try again. And this is probably my greatest reason for hope. To <clears throat> this intellect of ours makes us more different from other animals than anything else. And we are beginning to come up with solutions and we're beginning to think about our own environmental footprint. And then there's the resilience of nature. Places we've totally destroyed, nature given time will come back. Animals on the brink of extinction can be given another chance. And then finally, there's what I call the indomitable human spirit. People tackle what seems to be impossible and they don't give up. And so often they succeed and they inspire others around them. I think that any tool that allows an artist to create is an amazing thing. A group that I was working with, we just had a huge hit. They did it in 10 different languages. To me, that's a tool that helps the artist communicate more. I think AI can be beautiful, but, they, but AI can be diabolical, just like people. One day I was taking a lesson and my jazz tutor, he's never had a hit record in his life, but he saw that I was really upset this particular day. And he asked me why, because normally I'm so upbeat. And I said, well, look at these like lame songs that I got to play tonight, you know? And he says, no, nah, don't you realize they're, they're all hit records? Why would you call them lame? And I said, how can you call Honey, do, 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 oh, sugar, sugar. How could you call that a great composition? Here's the greatest lesson in my life. He says, because it speaks to the souls of a million strangers. And I went, 
oh my God, he just described an artist. I'm not an artist yet. I need to learn how to speak to the souls of people I will never ever meet. I wanted to do something that um, was from the heart that raised money to give it to people who really needed it or to do something. And when, when I realized that giving money away was not really the right thing, what we wanted to do was we wanted to give education away. Once we started to engage with teens, it was like, oh my God, this is incredible. Because just think about it. Teens have unlimited amounts of energy. They're opinionated. And at the same time, they also want to learn. So they're curious and they already feel like, well, we know more than you. And what we found out was not only was that our sweet spot, it was really our sweet spot. We wound up getting some of the most amazing teens from every country you can think of. The reason why I always use my life as an example, because it would, on paper, it would seem like it was impossible for me to wind up where I wound up. It, it just didn't make any sense. Um, but when you backtrack it and you sort of forensically figure out, hmm, wow, this guy is the only guy who's ever won the Lifetime Achievement Award. Oh, and a Grammy for a brand new record <laughs> at the same time. Like, like, wow, I, I guess he sort of knows what he's doing a little bit. Humans really care about what other humans think. That seems very deeply uh, wired into us. So chess uh, was one of the first like victims of AI, right? Deep Blue could be Kasparov, whenever that was a long time ago. And all of the commentators said, um, this is the end of chess. Now that a computer can beat the human, you know, no one's, gonna, no one's gonna bother to watch chess again, ever. It's over, or play chess again. Chess has, I think, never been more popular than it is right now, um, and if you like, cheat with AI, that's a big deal. And no one, or almost no one, watches two AIs play each other. Um, we're like very interested in what humans do. When I read a book that I love, the first thing I do when I finish is like, I wanna know everything about the author's life. And I wanna like feel some connection to that person that made this thing that resonated with me. Same thing for like many other products that, that humans know what other humans want very well. Humans are also very interested in other people. I think humans are gonna, we're gonna have better tools. We've had better tools before, but we're still like very focused on each other. And I admit it does feel different this time. General purpose cognition feels so close to what we all treasure about humanity that it does feel different. So of course, you know, there'll be kind of the human roles where you want another human, but even without that, I think, like when I think about my job, I'm certainly not a great AI researcher. Um, my, my, my role is to like, you know, figure out what we're gonna do, think about that, and then like work with other people to coordinate and make it happen. And I think everyone's job will look a little bit more like that. We will all operate at a little bit higher of a level of abstraction. We will all have access to a lot more capability and we'll still like make decisions, they may trend more towards curation over time, but we'll make decisions about what should happen in the world. The sort of open AI style of model right. is good at some things, but not good at sort of like a life and death situation. Um, but people under, I think people understand tools and tool limitations of tools more than we often give them credit for. And people have found ways to make ChatGPT super useful to them and understand like what not to use it for, for the most part. So 
I think it's a very good sign that even at these systems, current extremely limited capability levels, much worse than what we'll have this year to say nothing of what we'll have next year. Lots of people have found ways to get value out of them and also to understand their limitations. I think humans are pretty forgiving of other humans making mistakes, but not really at all forgiving of computers making mistakes. And so people who say things like, well, you know, self-driving cars are already safer than human-driven cars, it probably has to be safer by a factor of, I would guess, like between 10 and 100 before people will accept it, maybe even more. And I think the same thing is gonna happen for other AI systems, caveated by the fact that if people know, if people are accustomed to using a tool and know it may be totally wrong, um, that's kind of okay. I think, you know, in some sense, the hardest part is when it's right 99.999% of the time and you let your guard down. Uh, I actually can't look in your brain and look at the 100 trillion synapses uh, and try to understand what's happening in each one and say, okay, I really understand why he's thinking what he's thinking. You're not a black box to me. Um, but what I can ask you to do is explain to me your reasoning. I can say, you know, you think this thing, why? And you can explain first this, then this, then there's this conclusion, then that one, and then there's this. And I can decide if that sounds reasonable to me or not. And I think our AI systems will also be able to do the same thing. They'll be able to explain to us in natural language the steps from, from A to B, and we can decide whether we think those are good steps, even if we're not looking into it and saying, okay, I see each connection here, and you know, I don't get to like, I think we'll be able to do more to x-ray the brain of an AI than x-ray the brain of you and understand what those connections are. have to take the unintended consequences of any new technology um, along with all the benefits uh, and think about them simultaneously as opposed to waiting for the unintended consequences to show up and then address them. And so I think that's the, the, the fundamental change in the last 10 years because I, I feel like our license to operate as an industry depends on that because I don't think the world will put up anymore with any of us coming up with something that has not thought through safety, trust, equity. Uh, these are big issues for everyone in the world. And so I think, and this, by the way, is not new for many other industries, but it is a little new for the tech industry. And we have to sort of raise up to the occasion, if you will. Of course, it's not just being left to the industry. The governments all over, whether it's in the United States, we have an executive order in the US, we have, you know, we had a safety summit in the UK, the European Union cares deeply about it, China cares about it. So everybody's converging. That's also good to see the world sort of coming and saying, we need new technology, we need some guardrails, and we need norms of how we deploy this technology. And that, I think, that combination of private innovation with safety first approach to engineering, I would call it, and then regulation that allows us to ensure that the broad societal benefits are amplified and the unintended consequences are dampened, I think was going to be the way forward.
the biggest lesson of history is that not to be so much in awe of some technology that we sort of feel that we cannot control it, we cannot use it for the betterment of our people. So in that context, uh, we need our politicians to lean in. Again, this is the one time, if I look at the 70 year arc of human history, I mean, computing history, yeah. this is the easiest technology, right? In other words, the breakthrough here is in fact the 70 years we've been striving to find the most natural user interface so that computers understand us, not us understanding computers. So I don't think it's about politicians, it's about more about the technology needs to be simple enough, straightforward enough. It may be miss, you know, very high tech in, inside, but it should be governable. Uh, and the principles of governance should be clear and I'm very optimistic that that'll happen. <laughs>